ETH Mexico. Welcome to the Abacus Developer Workshop. My name is York Rhodes. I'm one of the lead protocol developers over at the Abacus Works team. And today we're going to be doing a general overview of the Abacus system, what potential projects you can build on the platform for the hackathon this weekend, um, and kind of the future of the protocol as we see it moving forward. So what is Abacus? Um, Abacus is primarily a developer tool and platform that enables you guys to build interchain applications. Um, now, you may have heard this term thrown around a lot, interchain applications. Um, if in traditional decentralized applications, uh, a smart contract system exists on a single blockchain, uh, an Abacus application, which is an interchain application, exists on many blockchains simultaneously. Um, and there's what we call a shared state model that these applications are architected in, which um, solves many problems with the kind of monolithic architecture um, that most decentralized applications have employed in the ecosystem thus far. Um, so today in this monolithic architecture, uh, decentralized app developers are faced with a choice when they set out on their journey of which blockchain they want to deploy on. And this choice has immense consequences in that it impacts the developer experience building that application out, the user experience um, once that application actually ships and users have to interact with it, uh, typically they're um, kind of require knowledge of the specific blockchain that the application is deployed on, as well as um, a platform risk that the developer team is taking on in that it may become very hard in the future for that application to migrate away from the initial platform that it deploys on. And the way that most developer shops go cross-chain uh, to mitigate some of these consequences today is they go and deploy a new instance of their monolithic application on a different chain. Um, and each one of these deployments of their application exists as a tire, an entirely separate uh, deployment and set of participants. Um, we call this like an island. The problem that this introduces um, is a fragmentation of network effects. So when an application like Uniswap wants to go cross-chain, whether they're trying to um, mitigate the platform risk of Ethereum mainnet that they're on, or they're trying to provide a user experience, which maybe has lower fees or um, lower latency for the users of their application, or they just want to access uh, some, some developer primitive that exists on some other blockchain, um, they go and deploy a new singleton instance of their smart contracts. Um, but the uh, set of participants of that new deployed instance uh, is entirely distinct from the um, kind of canonical deployment on Ethereum mainnet. And this is a problem because uh, the utility of most, uh, or the utility of any decentralized applications comes from the users and from the, the network effects of the users. And Uniswap is only as valuable as the uh, liquidity providers, um, the decentralized LPs that are willing to um, provide liquidity for other users to swap tokens through. And so when Uniswap deploys a new instance of their application on let's say Polygon, um, in order to bootstrap the utility for that deployment, they basically need to deploy liquidity incentives. Um, 
And typically these are basically short-term injections of uh, capital or, or additional interest rates that um, the DAO or the Uniswap Labs organization will manage to draw um, kind of initial traction to, to a deployment that they do on a new chain. Um, but there's this kind of classical problem in the ecosystem of liquidity providers being uh, what we call mercenary capital in that they're constantly just chasing the highest interest rate they can get for their um, LP service. And um, this, these liquidity incentives that Uniswap is deploying will eventually dry up uh, because it's not sustainable for them to be just paying for people to kind of initially bootstrap their application on a new chain. And the liquidity is, won't be sticky. So the liquidity will just migrate to wherever the next liquidity incentive is deployed, whether it's from Uniswap or some project which is forking their code base. And so what this means is um, there's not great ways for applications to um, kind of mitigate these consequences of the blockchain they initially deploy on uh, in, in, in the market today uh, and the way that most developer shops are, are scaling cross-chain um, is really unideal. And so with Abacus, we hope to solve this problem um, with a fairly unique approach in that um, instead of providing some additional blockchain with um, the same sorts of consequences uh, of developers choosing our ecosystem and kind of siloing their network effects to our ecosystem, Abacus is actually a network that exists between blockchains. Um, and the hope is that we can exist between all of the blockchains that uh, users are on and eliminate the choice for developers of deciding which is the right blockchain ecosystem for them to deploy their system on. And so they still get the, the same, I guess, developer experience when they're choosing Abacus of writing their smart contracts once, but um, they're actually going to deploy those smart contracts on all of the chains simultaneously. Um, and instead of these deployments having uh, strict boundaries between the set of participants, um, Abacus uh, enables this connective tissue between smart contracts on different chains uh, and between these different deployments. And so um, we can actually get composability of the smart contracts that are deployed on all of these different blockchains through uh, communication between the smart contracts. And um, this basically allows us to uh, concentrate our, our network effects into kind of a single um, global uh, application um, while making our application accessible to users that are on any blockchain. And so for both the end user and the developer, the experience should be quite familiar in that um, there's still a single chain interface for um, <clears throat> for for interaction and for development. So um, no one needs to go and kind of re-architect their application in a super severe way or understand this kind of new framework, new blockchain, new paradigm. Um, but you eliminate this platform risk um, and this kind of siloing effects that you have when you depend on a single chain. So how does this work? Um, so the Abacus system is implemented uh, completely in smart contracts, or the Abacus protocol, I should say. 
and um, we tried to break down the intra-chain communication concepts into uh, kind of real-world analogies. So it should be quite easy to understand. So <clears throat> the Abyskiss protocol consists of mailbox smart contracts that are deployed on all of the supported blockchains, um, more specifically an outbox and an inbox. And the outbox on each chain is uh, where you, um, you open up that mailbox and you put outbound messages um, for the mail service to go and you know send them off to deliver to whatever the, the address is on the front of your envelope. And um, there's various inbox inboxes on each blockchain, which allow you to receive mail from other blockchains. Um, now, in between these mailboxes, there are validators and relayers. Um, for the purposes of this hackathon, um, I don't think it will be super important for you to understand the nuances of the off-chain participants of the protocol, um, mainly the, the validators, but just to kind of go over the life cycle of this mail delivery system. Um, basically your application, when it puts mail in the outbox on a specific blockchain, the message is inserted into a Merkle tree and committed to by a Merkle root. And these off-chain validators are basically signing each Merkle root um, that new messages are committing to, and, or rather, are uh, producing. And messages, um, once they've been signed by a quorum of validators, they can be processed on the corresponding inbox contract on the destination chain. And so from the perspective of the application, you put mail in the outbox and you receive mail from the inbox. Um, and this all happens in smart contracts. So just to kind of illustrate this process, um, if your application exists on this blockchain over here, put mail in the outbox, and then there's these off-chain participants, um, the Abacus validators that are signing basically commitments to these messages that you've put in the outbox. And um, there's actually a separate role that will then go, a separate permissionless role that will then go and relay the signed messages that the validators Merkle root signatures are committing to um, to the inboxes of various other blockchains. Um, and uh, I guess to kind of just demonstrate the power of, or, or potential of this type of communication to um, compose into quite complex uh, application logic, um, you can imagine a single message um, on this blockchain over here uh, being sent between chains to a bunch of other blockchains um, and then subsequently causing um, additional messages to be dispatched back to the origin chain. Um, and you can have you know, quite complicated interchain communication um, just through this simple API. And um, you know, this has pretty massive um, implications from uh, DAP developer perspective. So that's kind of what I want to dig into for the purposes of this workshop. So what does it mean to build on the Abacus platform today? Um, so the Abacus Works team has built out a bunch of developer tooling for you to integrate with the protocol. Um, today, we are live on, I believe, um, seven EVM test nets, as well as seven EVM production mainnets. Um, 
please check out our docs to um, keep up with progress there. But um, like I mentioned earlier, we're hoping to basically be on <clears throat> to deploy the system between um, all of the blockchains where there's users, demonstrated demand. And so, um, you know, more coming soon. But uh, for now, we're going to focus on uh, the EVM uh, blockchains. Uh, the reason for that, um, hopefully it's not super controversial, but today I think we recognize the EVM as kind of a shelling point within the ecosystem and um, <clears throat> kind of confining the Abacus protocol to the Ethereum execution environment allows us to have some of these nice properties of basically maintaining only a single version of our smart contracts, um, which from a security perspective, um, at least while we're hardening our, our protocol, I think is super important to kind of um, minimize the attack surface area. Um, but what this also means is you guys only have to implement a single version of your smart contracts um, because there's only one integration surface area. So that's what I'll be going over first is the smart contracts SDK, um, the messaging API that that exposes, which I was kind of just illustrating. That's the inbox and outbox API. Um, we can talk about a few libraries that we expose that you can leverage as kind of like common utilities and then um, this router pattern that uh, is um, more of a specific application architecture that um, we think a lot of developers will benefit from, but um, is not required to integrate with Abacus. And then there's also a bunch of kind of peripheral or, peripheral or higher level tooling that we've built out for developers. Um, we have a pretty extensive TypeScript SDK um, which allows you to build kind of full stack web apps as well as integrate with all of the existing like build, test, deploy frameworks um, that smart contract developers use today, but in a multi-chain context. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then towards the end, we'll hop into basically examples and demonstrations of the Abacus system live in action. Um, and hopefully that'll be inspiring for you guys participating in the hackathon. So let's jump into the messaging API. Um, hopefully by now uh, you get the general overview of sending and receiving mail. Uh, so to send mail from your smart contract um, to another blockchain, you just call the outbox contract that Abacus uh, has deployed on that chain. You call the dispatch function on that contract, and then you have to specify, you know, what chain are you sending this mail to? What uh, recipient contract are you sending this mail to on that chain? And then, you know, what is your message content? And this can basically be formatted however you like. Um, it's kind of an application specific implementation detail. And then uh, conversely, uh, to receive mail, uh, what you have to do as a smart contract developer is implement this iMessage recipient interface. You specifically have to implement this handle function, which takes in the origin blockchain that uh, the mail was sent from. So where, where was the outbox contract that this mail was dispatched by? Uh, the sender address. Um, so who, which contract called the outbox.dispatch on the origin chain? And then uh, again, the kind of arbitrary message content that you can use to then go and, uh, you know, influence control flow in your application. Um, so this is like the minimal API that we expose today. And um, you can go and on our docs, you can find the addresses and uh, APIs and interfaces for these contracts. And you can actually go and, and dispatch cross-chain messages without even um, 
doing any development yourself, you could go and interact with the Outbox on Etherscan. Uh, so that's pretty pretty exciting. I definitely recommend you try that out. Maybe I'll demonstrate that at the end of this workshop. So this is really all you need to know to integrate with the Abacus system. Um, like I said, there's outboxes and inboxes on each chain, um, just to kind of elucidate what's going on with this iMessage recipient. Um, when you dispatch the message, I think we talked about this earlier, uh, there's these off-chain participants, which are relaying your, your mail from the outbox that you put a me message in to the corresponding inbox that you're sending to. Um, and actually this inbox smart contract that um, is part of the Abacus Core protocol will uh, do a uh, message call um, with your uh, these parameters to the recipient address as specified in, in the mail. So the inbox is the one that actually is doing this message call on your smart contract. Um, and so if you wanted to communicate between your own smart contracts, the recipient address that you pass in the dispatch function call must be a contract address which implements this interface on the destination chain. Um, and with, with this kind of simple interface, um, we can basically have these like kind of arbitrarily complex asynchronous communication between blockchains and between smart contracts. So, you know, again, very simple API, but um, it's kind of totally flips on its head um, the, what you can do in a, as a smart contract developer, now you have access to this like asynchronous execution environment. Um, you can communicate between chains. Now you don't have to just be confined to the state that's on the blockchain where your smart contracts are. You can go and query smart contracts that are on other chains or your own smart contracts on other chains. You can synchronize state. Um, it's kind of a whole world of things you can do. Um, but yeah, I want to talk a little bit about what additional tooling we provide to kind of simplify this integration experience for you. So kind of at the smart contract library level, um, we have some NPM packages that you can go and add as dependencies to your project that <clears throat> expose these libraries. So there's this Abacus Connection Manager and Abacus Connection Client. Um, basically, the general idea here is you need to know what addresses um, you're actually interfacing with um, to dispatch mail and to receive mail. Um, it's you know worth noting here that uh, you don't want any contract to be able to call your handle function because then kind of anyone could spoof a cross-chain message from your contracts. So you want to basically um, limit access control to your handle function to only kind of inboxes that are registered in the Abacus Core protocol. So the Abacus Connection Manager basically is like a registry of these important core protocol addresses. Um, where the domain to inboxes uh, mapping just maps uh, blockchain, remote blockchain identifiers to inbox addresses on those chains. Um, <clears throat> and so this connection manager is just kind of illustrative of the registry, um, but on the client side, when you're writing your smart contracts, you can um, install this Abacus Network app NPM package which exposes this abstract contract uh, that you can inherit from. The Abacus Connection client is just a simple wrapper around this manager that uh, keeps track of a manager address and state variable um, and allows your contracts to conveniently dispatch messages to the outbox and permission message delivery via um, some like only inbox modifiers. And there's what should be a familiar um, open Zeppelin ownable 
owner access control um, included in the, in this abstract contract for um, modifying the Abacus Connection Manager address in storage. And so you can imagine your smart contract system, maybe it's managed by a multi-sig or it's governed by a DAO with token voting. Um, that multi-sig or that DAO can be set as the owner of this connection client. And then um, if there was ever a you know, new deployment of the Abacus Core protocol where we needed to change the addresses of the outbox and inboxes, um, your multi-sig or your DAO could vote to basically upgrade the Abacus Connection Manager address to the new deployment, um, which um, is, again, this registry of the local chain's outbox and the inboxes um, from the supported remote chains. Um, worth noting, the Abacus Works team basically will manage a connection manager for you. And so um, it's kind of our intention that you just uh, set this address to the registry that we manage and you don't really have to think about um, upgrades or you know security vulnerabilities or, or things of that nature. Um, you just think about the access control of who can change this address in your client code. Okay. So I want to briefly talk about kind of the application architecture um, that we think many applications will benefit from uh, employing. And that is something we call the router pattern. So like I mentioned earlier, um, one benefit of the EVM dominance in the kind of smart contract developers world is we only have to write our contracts once, but because all these blockchains are EVM compatible, um, we can deploy the same smart contracts to all these different chains. Um, and, you know, that shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, typically, these blockchains are designed with like very different security properties um, in mind. They might have quite unique user demographics. Um, and so, you know, this property of EVM dominance and EVM, I guess, pervasiveness uh, allows developers to basically iterate faster. They only have to maintain a single smart contract surface area, um, but they're kind of inherently composable with any EVM compatible blockchain. So we've um, developed this router pattern that we think most smart contract developers can uh, can benefit from, which leans into this EVM chain interoperability um, that we see in, in the blockchain ecosystem today. So um, to explain a little bit what the router pattern is, um, it's worth digging into the analogy, I guess, to traditional networks. Um, so traditional network routers use what's called a static routing table um, and a simple routing policy to forward internet traffic that they're receiving from the rest of the internet according to some understanding of the network's topology. So, you know, we use the IP addressing protocol on the internet and routers use the IP addressing protocol to understand the network topology, kind of like where do these computers sit in the topology and um, they use that knowledge of kind of this IP topology to route traffic around the network. And Abacus router smart contracts um, are not too dissimilar in that they're made, made aware of the network topology through a routing table, um, which is basically a set of addresses of instances of these router contracts that exist on other chains. So this pattern allows router contracts to send messages directly to each other without needing a specific address to be provided. 
So each time your smart contracts have to communicate with each other um, instead of kind of in each one of those interchain communication calls providing the address of your smart contract, if your application employs the router pattern, um, it kind of is already aware of this static routing table and network topology of your system. And um, now you have basically this interface to dispatch messages to a specific blockchain without needing to know, um, I guess, the address of that router contract in the call and the message you want to provide. And um, similarly, uh, in, on the kind of receiving side of things, mail recipient side of, of things, um, the router pattern allows us to reject messages from untrusted applications because we have access to this network topology. And so um, we can basically have a, a generic access control mechanism that says that only routers which are registered in our routing table uh, can successfully send our router mail. And so um, from the developers, I guess, uh, consuming perspective, um, what this means is that you have these two internal functions um, if you're uh, consuming this, this library code that we provide. And you don't have to think really at all about uh, access control. You see these are both internal, so no other contracts can interact with these. Um, and all you have to do as a developer is kind of populate this routing table and you can then leverage these dispatch and handle functions. Um, which make it slightly easier to have kind of a symmetric uh, communication pattern between all of the smart contracts that exist across all of the different blockchains. Um, as a kind of brief aside, what's kind of exciting about the router pattern to me is uh, because we're uh, our applications logic is implemented in smart contracts, we can actually have um, kind of arbitrarily complex routing policies. And so this actually is kind of a, a big improvement over traditional networked routers, which have, um, you know, very simple or almost circuit-based routing policies. Um, we can now have like arbitrarily complex logic that influences our routing policy. And so you can imagine, um, or I guess one, one use case of this that I'm super excited about is um, a routing policy that minimizes the gas price of the target blockchain um, for your computation to be offloaded to. So, um, you could yeah, basically dispatch a message to be processed on some other chain where there's cheaper gas or cheaper fees, and you get this framework for kind of routing computation based on <clears throat> properties of those blockchains. So if there's some blockchain that has maybe like um, higher security or deeper liquidity for, for some pair, you can, you know, you can influence your routing policy based on um, this application state, um, which is uh, when that's possible, this pattern is actually called a software defined network. Um, I, I think I highly recommend you go and, and read up on, on what a software defined network is, but Abacus and, and this router pattern basically enables a framework for decentralized software defined networks, um, which I think is super cool. So um, Okay, now I quickly want to jump into the um, higher level tooling that um, the Abacus Works team has provided just as kind of utilities for developers like you who are looking to integrate with the system. Again, we're hoping to kind of lean into the familiar EVM 
developer experience. And so I think most of you will probably be familiar with the ethers.js library. Um, <laughs> ethers.js is kind of a library that allows you to interact with a blockchain um, using the JSON RPC um, and kind of wraps up a bunch of common utilities into a Node.js package. And um, the Abacus Works team has built out this tool called a multi-provider that basically just abstracts away the mapping from blockchains to specific RPC providers. Um, and this allows your application to kind of communicate with many blockchain states at once, um, as well as have utilities for transaction signing and estimating gas costs of different um, chains and also you know, waiting on a message that was dispatched on chain A to be processed on chain B, etc. I think you'll find this highly useful. Um, we also have a hardhat plugin. Um, if you're not familiar with hardhat, um, it's again one of these build, test, deploy frameworks for building smart contracts. Um, it integrates with the, I believe, Chai uh, JavaScript library that, that gives you this uh, testing syntax that I just wanted to illustrate quickly for how you can test your smart contracts cross-chain communication logic um, and actually unit test it. So you don't have to just test everything on testnet or mainnet, um, even though a lot of smart contract developers like to say they test in prod. Uh, you can also unit test your contracts uh, that integrate with Abacus. And we expose this through an NPM package. You can basically deploy a mocked version of the multi-chain Abacus system to your local hard hat node. This stub function will allow you to like simulate that message being relayed between the two blockchains. And then you can kind of proceed with a unit test that detects that that message was actually processed. You then need to go and test unit tests that um, whatever state change or event emission that you're expecting from that uh, message recipient handle function has occurred according to the message that you dispatched on the source chain. <clears throat> okay, so we, we've gone over building and testing. Um, once you're ready to deploy your application, um, we have provided this deployer tooling, which uh, basically simplifies the experience of deploying to many blockchains simultaneously. At most of these abstraction layers, there is a router pattern specific tooling. Um, so in this case, uh, the tooling, I, I'm just, I guess this is like pseudocode, but I'm just showing you a code snippet where if once you just have to implement the deployment of your contracts that implement the router pattern on a single chain and the abstraction will go and deploy your router contracts and then handle populating the routing table that I was referring to earlier, as well as, um, the management of the owner configured ownership. Given that this is a hackathon, um, I think it's worth spending some time looking at some example code uh, to get you inspired and excited about the potential of building on Abacus. Um, I believe there's also a few Abacus specific bounties um, that are available for you to pursue this weekend. So I definitely recommend um, checking those out on the Beef Mexico website. But um, yeah, we're gonna jump into some example application code. So um, I assume that most of you are familiar with the ERC-20 standard if you are familiar with the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, the ERC-20 standard is um, kind of the standard interface that the simplest token primitive must implement to be composable with 
um, kind of all of DeFi, all of the um, exchanges where you swap tokens or um, even Coinbase uses this, this interface, right? So um, probably the most widely used interface um, on the Ethereum blockchain in general. And um, we have built a, an Abacus token, which extends this ERC-20 standard to allow for tokens to move natively between chains. Um, so if you're kind of quite embedded in the space, you'll be familiar with uh, canonical token bridging, which allows uh, application developers to move ERC-20 chains between blockchains by creating basically like a synthetic wrapper of that token's uh, application balances um, on chain A um, to, to basically migrate those um, assets to chain B. Um, and the way this is accomplished is through a basically a lock mint. So you, you lock the tokens on chain A you can then mint tokens on chain B. Um, and then when you want to kind of unwind, you have to burn the tokens on chain B and then you can unlock your tokens on chain A. Um, Abacus takes a slightly different approach in that um, we think this kind of canonical token bridging setup um, leads to the same liquidity fragmentation issue, issues that I discussed earlier with um, kind of the Uniswap case study. So um, instead of creating a wrapped representation of your token um, on a new chain, which kind of still has this collateral or like, I guess, foreign debt dependency on some canonical chain that is the like canonical blockchain that your application can really never migrate away from, the Abacus ERC-20 token um, has no notion of a canonical chain, but where there's um, kind of collateral of the original token. But instead, if you as a developer um, want to leverage this implementation, or choose to, I guess, <clears throat> implement this interface, um, you can have actually natively fungible ERC-20s between Abacus chains. And so this is possible because instead of locking an existing ERC-20 as collateral on a source chain, and then doing the mint on the destination chain, and then, uh, I guess, to unwrap, you do the burn and then the unlock, um, instead, what we do is we actually just burn the tokens on the source chain when we want to transfer assets to a remote chain. And um, then on the destination chain, we receive a message which encodes the amount of tokens which were burned on the source chain. And um, we mint that amount to the recipient address that was specified in the cross-chain message. And so what this eliminates is um, the concept of a canonical or collateral chain for an ERC-20 token. So this means like uh, any application which builds with, with this standard in mind is never, I guess, never has this platform uh, embedding effect that uh, prevents them from migrating their application state or their users to a new chain. Um, without this kind of foreign collateral risk. Um, so this is kind of especially relevant to some recent uh, token bridge hacks that we've seen in the wild because um, there's kind of this like property of existing token bridges that all of the collateral uh, exists in the same smart contract. And so there is this massive honeypot that any token bridge uh, 
basically attracts the attention of uh, hackers that um, if they're will able to, to hack one of these token bridges, they get access to all of the collateral um, that's locked up in that one contract, um, which is kind of super scary. And as an application developer, you have this like shared risk with all of the other applications that are using the same token bridge you are. Um, and so um, your the likelihood that, that your project uh, is going to get hacked, I guess, is amplified by the aggregate value of collateral that's locked up in that token bridge. And so with an Abacus ERC-20, um, you eliminate this kind of shared risk um, of collateral because you don't have any escrow. So there's no uh, single contract that has kind of all this collateral, collateral risk embedded in it. Um, other than the, I guess, uh, transfer remote functions themselves. Um, but th the point is there's no, uh, there's no risk shared with other applications. You can deploy an, an Abacus ERC-20 and another application can deploy the same system and you'll actually have kind of application specific token bridges. Uh, because there's no, again, no concentrated collateral risk. Um, and so we kind of view this as, um, I guess, safer or preferable to canonical token bridges for a few different reasons. Hopefully I explained some of them well, but even beyond token bridging, um, I think in future, most decentralized applications will choose to employ a pattern like this um, because of all the benefits that you know we went over near the beginning of the presentation, uh, you again you don't have this platform risk. You can basically meet users on any blockchain that they're already on, um, and be immediately composable with all of the applications that they already use on that chain. Um, and anytime you identify a new blockchain with kind of a burgeoning ecosystem, you can go and just add that. Uh, you can deploy one of these outer contracts to that new chain, populate the routing table of all the other chains with that new deployment and, and new blockchain identifier. And then you get the native fungibility of your token uh, to, that, to that new chain without um, kind of having to construct this synthetic uh, wrapped representation of, of the, I guess, canonical token. Um, I guess just to illustrate the NFT version of this, um, we have basically the same functionality um, as the ERC set, as the ERC20, except uh, we've also done it for the 721, which is the NFT standard. Um, again, this just extends the existing standard with a transfer remote function that allows you to specify um, in addition to kind of a recipient address like you would on a local chain, there's now also a destination blockchain um, where that recipient is. And the specific token that you want to transfer, this is consistent with the kind of local transfer interface. Um, and again, we're just burning and minting the specific um, NFT identifier uh, on each chain. So there's there's no wrapping, there's no canonical representation. Um, all the chains that these router contracts are deployed on should be natively fungible. Um, it's worth noting that um, this is a very kind of naive implementation of Cross chain 721, in that um, when you introduce multiple blockchains to an NFT collection, you have this problem of identifier collisions. Uh, what that basically means is you need to ensure that the same uh, identifier within your collection, let's say you have a collection of like 10,000 <clears> 10, <000 throat> NFTs, 
what that means is you have NFT identifiers from like one to a thousand to 10,000, excuse me. And um, you, in the minting process, you basically can't allow those identifier, the same identifier to be minted on multiple chains. Um, because what that means is when someone transfers, uh, I guess, token 500 from chain A to chain B, and 500 already exists on chain B, now you have two people who own the same token ID. So obviously that's a problem. Um, this naive implementation, I guess, basically intends to uh, mint all of the 721s on a single chain, just in the initialize function. Um, and, and later the deployer can go and distribute those to other chains. But um, you can imagine a scheme where uh, each chain is allocated a specific subset of identifiers for like the minting phase, um, which allows you to load balance the, uh, I guess, execution, the minting execution. So there's this, uh, I guess, another like classic problem with the Ethereum ecosystem uh, when there's a big NFT launch, uh, you know, let's say, Noun Stow is launching a new uh, a new collection, um, and there's ten thousand NFTs available for for public mint. There's this problem where uh, you know thousands and thousands of users are simultaneously trying to uh, use the same kind of single thread. <laughs> Uh, Ethereum execution environment to mint, um, get lucky and, and mint one of these NFTs. And you get this problem that uh, you basically have this like priority gas auctions, like gas, classical gas wars. And you end up congesting, congesting the network unnecessarily. Um, and kind of like boosting up the gas price for everyone else on the network who isn't even necessarily aware of this NFT uh, mint that's, that's ongoing. Um, and so with Abacus, we could imagine a scheme where we're load balancing that minting congestion across all the Abacus supported chains. Um, and, you know, this allows you to, um, you know, reduce the fees for your users um, who want to participate in the mint because you don't have to fight in these like PGAs. Um, you can also allow users now to mint on the chain that they're already on. I think it's like always a point of confusion or friction for NFT projects who, let's say they're deploying on Avalanche because they want the mint to be cheap. They need to now go and get all their users to use a token bridge to move to Avalanche. Um, quite often those users don't know how to do token bridging or they get scammed. And then their NFT is stuck on Avalanche even though they're Polygon users or they're Avalanche or rather Ethereum users. Um, and they can't move that NFT around. They can't use it as collateral. Uh, they can't LP it and pseudo swap, et cetera. So this is a scheme which allows NFT developers to make their token natively fungible. You can load balance them in. I think this is like a super low hanging fruit. If you guys want to extend this implementation to accommodate for that sort of uh, minting scheme that um, acknowledges that you can have token identifier collisions and manages kind of specific identifier range allocations for different chains, um, that would be a super cool hackathon project. And then um, I guess those two tokens should be kind of a great demonstration of how to get started just thinking about the kind of interchain application model. But um, I also want to briefly touch on this um, app template, which kind of uh, is a great place for you to start from if you want 
the kind of full stack of uh, SDK tooling that we've built out um, to be like configured with with sane defaults. Um, so there's like a hello world contract. It employs the router pattern. Um, kind of demonstrates a simple cross chain message. Um, we are actually using this as kind of like a health check um, that we're running on a cron job uh, between all of our supported chains to ensure that messages are actually processing. Um, and you should be able to go and just click this button, use this template, and fork this repo. And this will be a, a great starting point for you um, in setting up your hackathon project. Um, so let's go through a, a few kind of further project ideas that um, I think would be really, really awesome for you to explore um, and would definitely satisfy uh, kind of the Abacus specific uh, hackathon prize. Um, so if you are familiar with kind of lending markets um, on in a single chain context, things like Compound and Aave have these um, systems where you can put up collateral uh, and take out a loan against your collateral um, with some sort of like automated liquidation. Um, you could imagine a scheme taking this cross chain where you can leverage uh, collateral which exists on remote blockchains. Um, so if you want, if you have maybe a crypto punk on ethereum um, that you're you don't want to move to a lower security environment but you'd love to have a usdc loan on uh, polygon just so that you can you know pay the bills <laughs> um, you could use that crypto punk as collateral in a cross-chain lending market um, and you can use abacus to kind of do the state synchronization. Um, I think we talked about the Uniswap uh, example at length, so I won't go into too much detail, but um, you can imagine building a cross-chain DEX, decentralized exchange, where you have global uh, or unified liquidity pools such that you don't have this like fragmentation of network effects and, um, you know, someone LPing on chain A or doing a swap on chain B um, can tap into kind of the global or aggregate view into um, all of the liquidity which is being provided on any chain. Um, another idea is doing a proof of stake yield aggregator. Um, this would be kind of like an interface into managing um, staking on chains which have like a native proof of stake uh, emissions. So um, I don't know how many of those chains are available uh, in production today, but I think this would be like a, quite a useful tool for, uh, you know, users and, and staking providers alike um, to manage positions across uh, multiple of these proof of stake chains. Um, you could build a cross-chain ENS or, or name service um, for resolving um, kind of more human readable uh, identifiers for specific addresses or specific pairs of blockchain and addresses. Um, this could happen atomically in the sense that you are replicating this registry across all the chains using Abacus or uh, conversely, this could happen asynchronously um, in that you do a, you know, if you want to resolve an Ethereum name on Avalanche, you do an asynchronous query to the Ethereum mainnet blockchain, look up uh, specific addresses uh, corresponding, or rather a specific names corresponding Ethereum address, um, and then return that uh, back to Avalanche for of use in, in application logic. Um, I talked a little bit about this uh, liquidity bootstrapping problem that uh, kind of some of the incumbents 
um, have encountered when deploying or going cross-chain. Um, you can imagine building a, uh, a balancer has this tool. Let me just pull it up. Balancer liquidity, bootstrapping pools, um, LBPs. Uh, basic premise here is this is used to kind of bootstrap uh, liquidity on a new deployment. And you can imagine using Abacus to uh, move around these uh, liquidity incentives um, with Balancer or wherever, I guess, Balancer is supported. Um, or you know you can even deploy your own LBPs. But uh, yeah, I think you know this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, hopefully, this gives you a general idea of like the potential of Abacus to disrupt some of the existing DAP architectures. Um, and yeah, like I said, any of the above would um, certainly uh, satisfy the um, hackathon prize that we have available for you guys. So uh, good luck with the hackathon. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll hear from you in our Discord. Um, but um, we always like to say that we are hiring. So if you do choose to integrate with Abacus um, with one of these projects, or even if you don't, um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, you can reach out to us via email. Um, I'd also probably just refer you to our website, useabacus.network, where you can get kind of all the relevant socials. Um, please hop in our Discord, um, follow us on Twitter, and check out the docs. I think this will be kind of first resource for you uh, during the hackathon. If all else fails, contact us in Discord for, for uh, additional help debugging or any questions you have about the system. Um, and yeah, I will be in person uh, at the hackathon, so I'm available to answer any questions or kind of sit by with you and maybe do some pair programming. But yeah, that's the end of my presentation. I'm excited to see what you guys end up building and good luck.